There we go. Now we're live. Or we will be in 10 or so seconds. And we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, 188. Now, this week, we have Gus, the African plan hunter, with us. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. And hi, guys, wherever you are. <laughs> um, he does um, a, all different types of wonderful videos on YouTube about all different types of plants across Africa. Um, and uh, if you haven't checked it out, be sure to check it out. It's a really cool YouTube channel, very educational. He's lots of different stuff on medicinal things, uh, different types of flowers and all different types of plants uh, from around Africa. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started doing uh, educational content there on YouTube. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I guess I am kind of an ethnobotanist by background. Um, I studied anthropology as an undergrad. I studied social ecology later on and I studied under, I actually studied in the States and I studied under uh, an amazing ethnobotanist um, called Michael Balick from the New York uh, Institute of Economic Botany, who was my team, very inspirational guy. But I've been working my whole career um, in Southern Africa and specifically my home Zimbabwe, where we're sitting now. And uh, my whole approach has been towards trying to promote conservation of indigenous plants. And for me, the way I see it, the biggest threat to our um, botanical diversity comes from agricultural uh, kind of extensification and, and conversion of um, of natural woodland to uh, arable farmland. And so for me, it's been really about adding value to indigenous plants and indigenous trees and trying to make it so that for a farmer, for a landowner, it's a much more rational land use to, um, to retain indigenous plants in situ than to uh, convert it into arable land. Now, in this part of the world, uh, generally, especially with the small scale farmers where they most of them live are quite poor, quite dry land areas. And it's really there's not a lot of arable opportunity there. So when you convert it, um, you, not much happens. It's just a disaster. You've lost all your plant diversity. But the problem is that these plants are there and people know them and they've had a long history of traditionally using them, but they don't necessarily see the economic value. How could having this plant there convert into cash in my pocket? And if I convert it and I plant something, and in this part of the world, the crop that they plant most is corn. And unfortunately, that doesn't come from here. It's not meant to be grown here. And it doesn't always do that well here, especially in the dry land areas. So you convert it and then you grow this thing. And then guess what? Nothing happens. Yeah. Um, it's a disaster. So, but, but if they get a little bit, they can still get some cash. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. So for me, I've gone into the educational side because I'm trying to show people that there are economic opportunities in every, every single plant that we have. And of course, I'm also trying to promote the cultural importance of them, the ecological importance of them. For me, it's really about biodiversity. That's what I'm, but for me, that's the big issue. That's what I'm trying to promote is conservation of biodiversity. But all these other points are kind of uh, means to that end. And so you did a lot of work around, especially with the trees uh, of, of Zimbabwe. I know there's a, a book that you cover in your, mm -hmm. your channel. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and some of the, the diversity of the different trees here in Zimbabwe? Yeah. Um, so Zimbabwe, um, it's not the most biodiverse country in the world, um, but we've got some, uh, some hotspots within Zimbabwe. Um, we're in a region of Southern Africa that does have high biodiversity. We got about 6,000 um, plant species in Zimbabwe. Um, and, you know, there is a long history of traditional use. Um, and uh, our trees are stunning, beautiful. I mean, if you, if you come to visit this country, as I'm sure you've seen, one of the overriding impressions you get is how wooded it is, how many trees there are, big, beautiful, spectacular, amazing trees. When you go and talk to like a forestry um, extension advisor to, let's say you had a piece of land and you wanted to know what trees to put on your land, this guy would almost certainly tell you, uh, you should plant eucalyptus tree, you should plant a pine tree, and you should plant some other tree that doesn't come from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really trying to do with trees 
is just to awaken people to the amazing bounty of indigenous trees that we have and to their use and value and and to show people that these trees are native to this environment they evolved in this environment they will always grow in this environment the climate can change but they will still survive our climate has changed in the past many times and they've survived mm -hmm. so I'm really trying to wake people up to the importance and value and the opportunities. Um, the book that you referred to is a book called Historic Trees of Zimbabwe. Um, so it was written by a guy now dead, unfortunately, called Lynn Mullen. And he had, um, sorry, that's my phone no, going. <laughs> he had um, picked up uh, over the years, he had lots of stories of fascinating individual trees um, that had, you know, particular historical significance. And so he wrote a book, uh, 75 trees in that book. And uh, I've been trying to go and visit each one of them and just, you know, retell the story just on video because uh, I think they're amazing stories. His book was not very well known and what widely it's out of print now. So I'm just trying to bring that alive and using that as a mechanism for that. So yeah, it's very cool, especially seeing uh, you go to the different areas where there was a, a different type of tree and now everything's kind of changed or seeing how the environment's changed since you know how the book has been written a long time ago it's really kind of interesting and yeah it's a constantly follow. evolving landscape of course <laughs> yeah so what are some of the other interesting plants that you've had a chance to to cover or maybe you want to get a chance to you know things on your list coming up i think in my head i sort of divide uh, plants into three broad areas of use. Um, of course, there are many more, but I, I, I look at plants for their food and beverage use. Um, you know, traditionally bit, bits of this plant, fruits, the nuts or whatever that get eaten or the leaves um, or made into a beverage, into a tea or an alcoholic beverage. I'm always interested in alcoholic beverages. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of one category. Um, then there's the use of plants in um, cosmetics. So skincare, um, you know, hair care, that kind of thing, which is obviously a big area of plants. And for me, that's a very interesting one because when you're looking at the commercial opportunities from plants, um, the barriers to entry there are quite low because it's not something you're putting inside you, it's something you're putting on you. I mean, the part of the problem globally and i've spent you know the other part of my career has been actually trying to commercialize indigenous plants part of the problem that we have here is that a lot of our plants have not been through the regulatory processes to allow them to be marketed in say the us or the european union or whatever um, but the barriers are lower for cosmetics so i'm always looking at that and of course everyone wants to know how to make themselves look younger so there's people are always interested in that yeah, I, remember, I remember especially you're talking about the lemon bush tree which people i'm sure in the states would love to have access to. absolutely but, they, they but it's illegal yeah, yeah sorry guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did it once i once took a plant it was the baobab actually mm -hmm. um through the regulatory hurdles to sell it into the eu and to sell it into the us through mm -hmm. the fda mm -hmm. um and it took about three or four years of my and several other people's lives mm -hmm. and a lot of money and sadly, I just, you know, I don't have the resources endlessly to be doing that again and again. I mean, by my kind of, um, you know, back of an envelope calculation, we've got at least 30 plants, which I think we could very quickly take through the regulatory process, but it would cost us money. Mm -hmm. And that I think consumers in, in the rest of the world would be absolutely thrilled once they discovered these plants. And right now they'll never know them unless they come here. Absolutely, yeah, wow. and there's, it was, I went to, had, well, I had a chance to spend a lot of time in South America and they have a very similar scenario where they have all these wonderful native plants, but they can't get them registered for, That's right. for X, Y, and Z. So you did a lot of work with baobabs. You were recently uh, speaking at a conference mm -hmm. or running a conference. Mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that and some of the work. Yeah, I mean, the baobab tree's really been my kind of biggest life mission. Um, and that's because when I started on this journey more than 20 years ago, looking at uh, plants that I could um, successfully commercialize to try to prove the point, mm -hmm. uh, which was my point, which was that there's actually more benefits from from managing indigenous plants, then from clearing them and planting exotic imported crops. 
Um, so I choose Baba because it was the, it seemed to me like metaphorically, excuse the pun, the lowest hanging fruit. Um, it was the one that was going to be the easiest to sell. I mean, this is of all the trees in Africa, apart maybe from the kind of flat top acacia, um, but the Baobab is the most instantly recognizable to the rest of the world. It's got fantastic properties, um, properties, food and beverage, health properties from the um, fruit and also cosmetic properties from the seed of the seed oil, also the leaf. Um, so it's very widely used. And yeah, I've been working that. I actually run a business that um, that processes and sells Baobab in the US um, and in Europe. Um, and I'm also involved in this association of Baobab producers from across Africa um, called the African Baobab Alliance, trying to promote uh, knowledge and awareness in the market about Baobab. Our biggest obstacle is that most people haven't heard of it outside of Africa. Um, so when you tell someone about it, you know, there, there's a lot of education that has to be done. I mean, we're fighting against or fighting, but, but our sort of competitive products, it, like let's say in the U.S., are probably Moringa, which is way more well known, Acai, which is way more well known, um, and we're Baobab that no one's ever heard of. So we've got a long way to go. There's a lot of work to be done. I think a lot of Americans have seen the pictures of the giant Baobab trees, but they don't know that you can exactly. use them and utilize them. And exactly. Kind of exactly. Yeah. That's, that that story has yet to be told. <laughs> So what are some of the other interesting plants you've had a chance to cover? I know you did the firebush, which has some of the, the crocus, uh, crocusine, not crocusine. Uh, colchicine. Col colchicine, yeah, yes. Yeah, now, yeah. Can you use the colchicine similarly to the North American stuff? So you use colchicine for polyploidism for making seedless stuff. That you take it, concentrate it, and expose it Absolutely. to seeds, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, um, so uh, this plant, Gloriosa superba, which is our national flower, actually, the flame lily. Um, is quite a rich source of it, but colchicine is found in many different plants. So, okay. yeah, it's never been used from uh, Gloriosa for that particular use. I mean, the reason that uh, that this flower is perhaps so interesting has been its potential use in uh, cancer treatment and, and wide, wide, wide traditional history of medicinal. I mean, astonishingly diverse. Um, I did an episode on its uh, use in Ayurvedic medicine. The only species I've done from Africa that's also used in Ayurvedic mats. And there are others, of course, but the only one that I've covered. Yeah. yeah. But actually that's that was the third category of 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 sort of general interest is medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. um, and of course we have such an I mean, you know, think about it. In Zimbabwe until a hundred and twenty years ago, the only form of medicine here was traditional medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, I mean, the numbers are astonishing in Zimbabwe, we, and I don't, don't quote me on these numbers because I'm, um, these are just roughly, um, we've got roughly 2000, um, kind of allopathic conventional medical doctors. We got nearly 60,000 traditional healers. So that's a phenomenal body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's been documented to an extent. There was one guy in the 1960s, 1970s, um, who he was himself a medical doctor, um, a Jewish guy called Michael Gelfand, who lived in Zimbabwe. And he documented extensively the medicinal plants uh, that were being used by traditional healers. He interviewed about 250 traditional healers over an extended period and, and documented and recorded in a book that is, again, out of print. <laughs> Uh, called the traditional medical practitioner in Zimbabwe, but a book that I use all the time I refer to and an absolutely amazing wealth of knowledge. Um, but we're just beginning with the medicinal plants here. We're just beginning. So we know that they've been traditionally used. There's been some academic research into some of them. You know, you can find, figure out that there are compounds in this plant that are similar with another plant, which has been better researched. But I mean, we're so, we've got so so far to go in terms of documenting and understanding uh, the medicinal applications of the herbs that we've got in Zimbabwe. Is there any particularly interesting or noteworthy medicinal plants that you've uh, had a chance to learn about? The plant that I've probably spent most of my time working on because I came into it from a cosmetic point of view and then started getting interesting, interested in the medicinal properties of it um, and I have done episodes on this as well. And I'll tell you a funny story about that in a minute. <laughs> um, uh, is the uh, Kigelia Africana, which is called the sausage tree. 
Um, and it's an amazing, beautiful tree, grows in riverine areas. And it has this fruit, big, long fruit, really heavy, uh, three or four kgs. Um, and uh, the story was that when there were early European settlers in Africa in the kind of 1700s or so, um, and they started figuring out quite early on that they were not used to the levels of sunshine here and that they were getting, you know, sunburn and whatever. Um, so this is, I'm particularly talking in South, South Africa. Um, they were taught by locals that the way to treat sun damaged skin was through cutting slices of this fruit and applying it topically. Well, it turns out, of course, that, um, that this is a very well known and now widely appreciated uh, use of this plant is to treat sun damaged skin. And in fact, I started, um, it still goes uh, a skincare range myself um, about 10 years ago with some friends um, using Kigelia Africana extract uh, to treat sun damaged skin because obviously um, sun is the primary factor of aging our skin i mean that, that that's what makes it look older than anything else <laughs> so if you can if you can treat that you know it, it's it's attractive to a lot of people <laughs> but but the really interesting thing has been um its effectiveness in top, top, topically treating skin cancer um and related ailments um and we've got a long way to go with uh, kigelia africana there was um so a lot of research done in the 1980s in the United Kingdom um, from a couple of uh, uh, pharmacists there, pharmacologists there um, on it. Uh, one guy did his PhD on it, um, and but but we still there's plenty of time to go. And I I had my chance. So the I think it's called the National Cancer Institute in in, in the US or something like that that does screening, high throughput screening. Mm -hmm of medicinal plants uh, that could be effective in the treatment of cancer. And I had an opportunity and I gave them some Kigelia and I totally messed it up because I was too naive. I gave them old plant material um, and I didn't realize that a lot of the compounds in it that are effective are volatile and they evaporate off and you only get them in the fresh material. And when they screened it, it they said, yeah, it's, it's active, but it's not super active. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I know this thing is super active. And then I realized, oh, idiot. But now I know. So I'm hoping one day I'll get a second chance with it. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. Is there any other particularly noteworthy medicinal plants that you've uh, had a chance to learn about? Yes. Well, another plant that um, uh, is of great interest um, that uh, you can see if you look in some of my uh, YouTube videos I've I've done a focus on is called um, the resurrection bush um, and I'm, I'm an idiot I should have brought you some to show it to you but anyway so this is a shrub mm -hmm. that grows in Zimbabwe and a few neighboring countries and it grows in very rocky hilly places in fact you look on the side because it's very um, common part of our landscape here is these bare rocks. I went to um, the Joshua Tree Park in the States. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's all these bare rocks. And I looked around and I thought, geez, I've, I've died and woken up back in Zimbabwe. <laughs> it's exactly the same. So if you imagine on those bare rocks, a plant that grows, um, you think there's got to be something really special about that. And so what it does is it colonizes small cracks and crevices in, in these rocks. And whatever tiny amount of organic material there is there, it puts roots down. And then it just, it, it has adapted to the fact that it only gets a little bit of moisture a year and it'll come in one big go mm -hmm. when, there, when it rains down the side. And so its whole life cycle is based around that. And when the water comes, boom, this thing springs to life. And then in the rest of the year, when, it, when there's no water, it shrivels up and it appears to be dead. Mm -hmm. When you look at this plant, it's like that is dead. But the reason we call it resurrection plant is because as soon as you expose it to a little bit of water, it comes straight back to life and it's not dead at all. Um, now, there's a lot of compounds in this plant um, of medicinal use. There's also a lot of compounds in this plant that are associated. Well, OK, let's let's call it that associated with its ability to um, come back to life, as it were, to revive itself. Um, now, the medicinal plants are really interesting, again, in, um, uh, well, 
a, a lot in cosmetics in terms of anti-aging, um, reviving tired skin. Um, medicinally, uh, there's some anti-cancer activity there as well. Um, and then uh, from a genetic point of view, the research is going on, and I'm not really in favor of uh, GM genetic modification, but I understand the rationale for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a scientist in uh, South Africa, the University of Cape Town, who's been researching taking um, genes from the resurrection plant to put into food crops to enable them to become more drought tolerant, which oh, okay. is interesting. I mean, yeah. that, is, that is interesting. That's a, that's a little gift from Mother Nature, maybe. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think we occasionally you see them in the stores. I think in the states you put them in the water and they kind of unfurl. Yeah, that's a that's a different plant. A different so yeah, so that's an American plant. Um, it's called the Joshua something or the Rose of Jericho. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's then our one is a completely different plant. It's only found in Southern Africa. Okay. I don't think anyone's ever even seen it outside of Southern Africa. Um, okay. We supply it to a few cosmetics companies, mm -hmm. um, and I got contacted by uh, by one of them saying that they wanted to to grow it in <laughs> one of their gardens to be able to show their customers. And I said, "This thing doesn't grow naturally. Yeah. <laughs> There's only thing, it only grows where it grows. Right. Uh, you can't just go and stick it in the ground and cultivate it like that. It's, it's not going to work." And that's a great thing that, you know, you're being getting involved in some of this stuff so that people aren't over harvesting things and it's actually being taken sustainably because, you know, if you have a plant like that, that you really can't grow outside of its range. It's important that you know, people like you are involved so that it doesn't get over exploited. You know? So I'm um, involved with a certification mechanism called Fair Wild. Mm -hmm. um, so Fair Wild was set up originally by the World Wildlife Fund. Um, in the 1980s for medicinal plants. It was called the medicinal and aromatic plant standard. And it's now put into this commercial, um, commercially usable um, uh, certification system, a bit like organic. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does two things. It measures the, the sustainability of the wild. So it's only for a wild harvested plant. Mm -hmm. And it assesses the sustainability of the wild harvesting and the fair trade conditions under which this product is harvested. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's not a very well-known system. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have a lot of consumer interest and uptake. So it's really for me to, to, to be doing it. I do it for Baobab. Mm -hmm. um, I really have to convince the customers that it's worthwhile mm -hmm. just so they have peace of mind to know that it's sustainable. But, but it's very, very, very comprehensive. So we get once a year, we get an inspector and that inspector is a professor of botany from a university in South Africa. And he comes here every year and literally goes around and monitors to assess that we are harvesting sustainably. Um, so it's serious. And I, and I, be, I mean, I absolutely believe that is the way to go. I mean, for me, one of the opportunities for marketing uh, sustainably wild harvested natural ingredients is for companies and producers to understand that if they want to support biodiversity conservation, you actually need to use these mm -hmm. because by using them, you're creating value for them and creating value for them makes it likely that they will be conserved. So, so my real ultimate mission in life is to show a consumer living in San Francisco or Hong Kong or Taiwan or wherever that even though they are thousands of miles away from African biodiversity, every day they take decisions that potentially have an impact, positive or negative, on our biodiversity and to show them how they can make a decision that will have a positive impact. That's so cool. What was the name of that certification again? It's called Fair Wild. Fair Wild. Yes. That's such a wonderful yeah, yeah, setup yeah. and a great, great way to, to, to handle that problem because we have issues with this in the United States with OSHA root, which is a very strong uh -huh. antiviral. And it's been you know, completely wiped out of a lot of its native range in the United States. So it's mm -hmm. really cool to see that there's actually a structure set up, especially for a place like Africa where things can be exploited. They, they <laughs> <very> can. <quickly. laughs> they can. That's true. Um, so we got a question from chat. It says, do you have uh, or know people here in Africa doing frankincense or mirth or dragon blood tree sap? I know dragon blood trees, I think, is only from um, the Indian Ocean, from some of the islands. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right? Yeah, that's right. I, I couldn't tell you that. But uh, frankincense and myrrh, yes, I absolutely do. Um, and in fact, um, there are efforts to get uh, the first frankincense 
company through the fair wild certification system that I just talked about. So when I was in Europe, I've just come back from Europe, um, all, both for this Baobab Congress um, and also for a trade show, a big organic uh, trade show at the trade workshop for the fair wild uh, foundation and uh, we were talking there about frankincense so yes frankincense obviously comes from the horn of africa so you're mostly looking at um, somalia um, i think a little bit in sudan maybe northern kenya mm. um and you know that's quite a, a troubled area politically so it's a bit difficult from the supply side but uh, but there's definitely stuff going on there and it's very cool and very interesting stuff very cool what are some of the rarer plants that you've maybe come across in your your travels in Africa, anything particularly, you know, rare or, or unique in, uh, or maybe any carnivorous plants that you're, uh, that are from out here? <laughs> I get asked the carnivorous plant <laughs> story all the time. It's like, so tell us about a carnivorous plant from <laughs> Africa. Yeah. Yeah, the truth is, um, I'm mostly focused on, not on, uh, although the, I've used the plant hunter uh sure. name to imply that i'm always going to try to find the most rarest plants sure. actually what i'm much more focused on is is the more common plants because those are the ones where uh, the real commercial opportunities are sure. so uh, i can't tell you any fascinating exciting stories about really wild and rare well i could but that would take a long time and a lot of beer probably <laughs> um but I, i'd rather focus on the on the sure. fact that our kind of common native species are the ones that really need most protection and the ones where the opportunities exist sure now do you have a lot of issues with pest pressure here in zimbabwe or is everything because of this the, the scale and the, the way that you're, you're utilizing these plants it doesn't seem to be too much of an issue or do you do end up with with certain times or sure certainly up in northern africa uh, yeah, with the locust swarms and everything that yeah them, we don't have the i guess the biggest um, kind of uh, pest here that that is a regular threat to grain growers um, is the quelia, the this bird that um, flocks in massive, uh, dense formations and then will descend on um, on a on a field and just strip it bare. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of um, measures over the years to try and control them. Um, one pest that that particularly bugs me is the chaffer beetle. Mm -hmm. um, so we, when you got a fruit tree, and these things will just appear as a swarm from nowhere, like they just appear, and they will stay on your tree for 24 hours, and when they leave it, there's nothing left. They just take every fruit on it. So oh, my plum trees and peach trees and whatever, every year <laughs> these these guys come along. But I mean, you know, my thing with pests is all about um a diversified polycultural production system if you got that really it's not an issue the pests come in when you get monoculture so just don't don't, don't take a oh, monocultural yeah. approach to it then you won't have problems with pests that's, that's it absolutely yeah uh, we do a lot of work with um, companion planting and, mm, and all that type of stuff mm, what we do and then we're also bringing in for our operation here we're bringing in beneficial insects from south africa there's a big insectarium down there and okay using that so that we don't have we're not bringing in a bunch of chemicals or killing off everything nearby it just kind of handles mm. you know, the immediate area where we are and, and very targeted with the insects that we're trying to treat so it can be a great way great Good way as luck. Well to do that <laughs> oh yeah well a lot of experience doing this in the yeah, yeah, yeah. In a similar climates yeah. over in the caribbean so i'm not okay. too intimidated okay <laughs> Unless we get a locust swim, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> That's good. That one happened, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, well, is there, um, do you want to tell us maybe about some of the stuff coming up in your your content? You know, in the, in the yeah, future? sure. So um, I'm uh, been working on a pilot for a documentary series, um, and I've got no idea if it's going to work or not, um, or if it's going to get taken up. So I'm trying to pitch it to production companies. So I'm just about to. To, to reveal the pilot, which I shot, um, and it's called African Roots. And the idea is to explore um, the African origins of various plants that are now in global commercial use. Actually, frankincense is one of the ones I want to look at because awesome. every Catholic church in the world uses frankincense. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coffee's another one. I mean, coffee's comes from Ethiopia, obviously, oh. originally. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think most coffee consumers in the world have no idea that they're actually, yeah. this is an African product that, they, that they're consuming and so on. There are many different um, uh, 
species around the world that are in full use that people have no idea come from Africa. And I'd love to be, be able to show people those. Um, my ongoing series is just called the African Plant Hunter, where I just do little stories about different African plants. That's my main kind of um, educational mission. I'm just preparing a new one um, called Into the Wild Zimbabwe. Um, because obviously in the process of filming, um, which I will basically do by myself or with a friend holding a camera. So we're, we rank amateurs at this. Um, but in the process of filming, we get out to some quite wild places. And a lot of people ask me about the places I've been to. Oh, you've been up there. How, you know, how do you get there? Whatever. So I'm also want to do a new, um, a new series just to show people how to get out to some of these wild places. Cause I think people will enjoy them. And then my, my, my pipeline, I've also got this year a book in, in preparation on indigenous plants in Zimbabwe, useful indigenous plants in Zimbabwe, um, which I'm very excited about. Super excited yeah, about that one too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and another long-term pipeline project for me, which um, is exactly what I just said about trying to, show, trying to educate consumers in the rest of the world on, on how their consumption decisions positively and negatively impact, impact our biodiversity. You know, everyone talks about African biodiversity and, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could conserve, you know, these amazing savannas and woodlands and so on, but without necessarily realizing that stuff that you do has an impact and that, that, that I can, if I can help to show you that, uh, I think it would make a big difference. So that's where I would like to go. That's really, really wonderful. And uh, uh, how can, uh, do you have a name for your book yet that you're writing for the Zimbabwe one? Or? I'll, when, it, when, the when the time comes, when okay. the time comes, yeah. I'll we'll yeah. have to have you pop back on so we can promote <laughs> it for you. That would be great. <laughs> but uh, my site is AfricanPlantHunter.com. Um, Facebook is African Plant Hunter. Instagram is African Plant Hunter and YouTube is African Plant Hunter. So awesome. any of those ones. Oh yes, and I'll tell you my funny story uh, about the Kigelia Africana. So, um, you know, my in most of my audience are here in Southern Africa and the, the, the biggest medium for viewing is actually Facebook. Um, and that's just because Facebook generally is free. Most people look at the internet on their phones. Facebook is free on their phones, but YouTube uh. isn't. So I have a lot less YouTube views. Um, know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I did one story on the um, Kigelia Africana. And I, as I was talking, I remembered this story about how this thing um, is used in some tribes in West Africa or some societies in West Africa um, as a penis enlarger. And it's used... <laughs> And the traditional use is quite literally is that you tie it onto the end of your penis. <laughs> so 4 kg weight, it's probably going to have an impact. Yeah, so so I, I did this episode and I said, uh, Kigelia Africana, the African sausage tree, natural uh, penis enlarger. <laughs> and literally, like, you look at my YouTube views. I got this video gets this, this one gets this, this <laughs> one. <laughs> it's like this. Oh, goodness. I'm in the wrong business, man. Right? I should just be talking about penis enlargement. <laughs> To the penis enlarging plants of Africa. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Great story. Uh, one yeah. thing I wanted to touch on is because you were talking about traveling around so much in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is an extremely safe country. If you're ever looking for a cool African place to see the wildlife and lots of different plants, it's one of the safest in Africa. And, and a lot of I know a lot of Africa, maybe especially for Westerners, doesn't have the best of reputations as far as safety. But um, you know, Zimbabwe is a really safe country compared to a lot of other parts of Africa. And uh, you see, if That's I told I you that, you might not believe me because I'm partial because it's my country. Yeah. But he just told you that and he's an American. So take it from him. It's absolutely true. Zimbabwe is an amazing country to travel in. It's it's Africa for connoisseurs. It's not Africa for beginners. If you want to do that, you go to Kenya or South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want, if you really want to get under the skin and see the proper wildlife uh, experience, the culture, the beauty, then come to Zimbabwe. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us. And uh, we'll have to have you on again in some time in the future. I'll show I, you my book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I really love your content. And uh, it was wonderful to have you come on and, and tell our listeners about some of the you know other work and of other botanists that are around uh, um, doing their different things. And especially, you know, learning all about the, the 
uh, what was it certified wild or say wild fair, fair yeah, wild yeah, yeah. Sorry, fair yeah. wild especially learning about that and, you know i didn't even know that was a, yeah. a certification people could get but i know that there's a lot of other people out there that um are thinking about similar types of models for different types of crops around the world and if they can adopt that that's really Absolutely. wonderful i think you can find it fairwild.org i think if you go look at that you'll find all the details you need to know awesome <laughs> and we'll have all the links to uh, links to that as well as uh, his information in the description uh, in both the audio and video format. So thanks a lot for uh, joining us, guys. Uh, sorry for the weird time this time, but uh, I want, got a chance to sit down with him and I've been wanting to sit down with him for, for a little bit of time here. I mean, we've been talking for about a month or two. So we have. It's, uh, it's been wonderful to uh, finally sit down together and record an episode. So thanks everyone for yeah. watching. Thanks to all the listeners and um, we'll be back again soon. You can find out the podcast at potentponics.com, potentponics on YouTube, potentponics on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio or your favorite podcast uh, site. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll catch you guys again uh, next time. Thank you guys.